Good evening, friends, and a very warm welcome to our evening service here at the Tron Church. We'll begin with some words from the book of Revelation about the great future. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Well, our first song, our first hymn tonight is number 570, 570, and this too is about the city. Glorious things of you are spoken, Zion, city of our God. 570.
Well, let us bow our heads together and have some moments of prayer to the Lord, lifting up our hearts to him, expressing once again our trust in him, our love for him, our joy in his power and his promises and his great victory over death and Satan. I'll read some words that Jesus himself said about his relationship to his own father and about the great things that he gives us. All things have been handed over to me by my father, and no one knows the son except the father, and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Our gracious Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for these words, and we thank you for the power and authority which has been given to you, handed over to you by God the Father. And we thank you not least, dear Lord Jesus, that those who know the Father are the ones that you have given the power, the ability to understand him, those to whom the the Son chooses to reveal him. And we thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for all that you have taught us about God the Father through the words of the Bible, the whole Bible. And we pray that you will give us the grace to hold on to them, to hold them fast, to seal them in our hearts and to live by them with joy. We thank you too, Lord Jesus, for your lovely invitation, your gracious invitation to come to you, especially as we feel labor and uh, the weight of heavy burdens. And we thank you for your promise to give us rest. Thank you that we have rest from the accusations and charges of the law of God, which otherwise would bring us down, and yet you free them, free us from them. We thank you, too, that you have given us a yoke to take upon ourselves, but it's your yoke, and we rejoice in being able to be yoked to the plow with you so that you take the strain and teach us and enable us to do your work in your way. Thank you for your invitation to learn from you because you are gentle and lowly. And we do pray that you will teach us more and more week by week as we read our Bibles and as we discover more of your character and your grace, your kindness, your tender mercy, your willingness to lay down your life in self-sacrifice for our sake and the power and authority given to you by God the Father to take up your life again at the resurrection. So please continue, Lord Jesus, to teach us. We long to learn more from you because naturally our minds are dull and empty, but it's you who speak to us and enable us to know you better. Teach us more of the shape of gospel work as the Bible understands it and give us such love for you and such love for your people that we are able to engage in the work with a will and with enthusiasm. And we pray that our being here tonight, Lord Jesus, in your presence and in the presence of each other will be a great encouragement to all of us. Please build us up. Show us things that we do not know. Give us strength at the points in our life where we are particularly weak and help us to run the race that is set before us, looking to you as our great example and our pioneer. And we ask it all for the sake of your great name. Amen. Amen. Well, do look up there, friends. <clears throat> Let me say again, it's very good to see you all here, especially if you're a visitor um, or a, a new person to us. We're, we're delighted to have you here. We will be serving hot drinks and cold drinks at the end of the service downstairs, and that's a good chance for us to meet each other, to talk to each other, also to meet uh, and join with our Iranian congregation who are meeting downstairs now, and they'll be having their Farsi service Uh, at any time as well. Do pray for them, and let's uh, seek to get to know them as best we can. 
I just wanted to mention our Gospel Partnership uh, questionnaire. Many of you I know will have filled in this famous form by now. It's really for members of the church, but the idea is that we all fill it in and we tick the boxes which indicate where we're willing to help and to serve in the life of the church and also tick some important boxes on the other side. If I'm needed, I'm reading the form, if I'm needed, I'm willing to serve in the following locations. Tron Central, Tron at Kelvin Grove, Tron at Queen's Park. That's a very important piece of the questionnaire, so do uh, be thoughtful about that. Alison Hare, I think, will be standing at the door. If you haven't got a copy of this, and she'll have copies there, do take it away, fill it up, and, and bring it back uh, perhaps next week or get it to us in some other way. Good. We're in good voice tonight. <clears throat> the Christian church has always been a singing church, a singing body. It's a lovely thing to sing together, isn't it? To sing to the Lord, but also, of course, to sing to each other and to encourage each other in, in our faith. So let's look up at the screens now. And we're going to sing a setting of uh, Psalm 62. For God alone my soul must wait in silence. From him alone shall my salvation come.
now we come to our reading from the Bible, which tonight is Psalm 127. Psalm 127, and if you have one of our big hardback Bibles, you'll find this on page 518. Psalm 127, page 518. Now, if you have the psalm open before you, you'll see that it has a title. Well, actually, there are two titles given to to it in, in the ESV Bible. The first one, Unless the Lord Builds the House. Now, that's something just put in by the modern editors of the Bible. But the other title is more important, A Song of Ascents of Solomon. And that is part of the original text. That's part of the inspired text. And you'll see, if you look around, that every psalm from Psalm 120 through to Psalm 134 is also called a song of ascents. So we have here a group of 15 psalms in total. Most of them are pretty short psalms as well. Four of them are ascribed to David. Ten of them have no named author. And just this one 127 is ascribed to Solomon. Now, nobody knows for certain why these psalms are called the Songs of Ascents. But the best guess of most Bible scholars is that they were sung by the Jewish people, the Israelite people, on the road to Jerusalem. The law of Moses required the Jews to go to Jerusalem on pilgrimage two or three times a year to celebrate the great festivals like the Passover in the spring or the Feast of Tabernacles in the autumn. And so groups of Jewish people, family groups and clan groups from the farms and the villages and towns, they would be on the road for perhaps two or three days uh, on their way to Jerusalem, and they would sing as they walked, and these were their songs. That's good to sing while you walk. During the First World War, some of our soldiers used to sing on the march, and those songs that uh, I guess we've been hearing on the radio again in the last day or two, like it's a long way to Tipperary, and keep the home fires burning while the hearts are yearning. Those are the kind of songs that the soldiers sang on the road to sing, to keep your spirits up, and to help you to think about the meaning of your life. Now, these psalms are called songs of ascent, or ascents, because Jerusalem is built on a number of hills. So as you walk to Jerusalem, especially the last few miles, you're going up, you're ascending to the city. And uh, my plan, God willing, is to look at five of these songs of ascents over the next five Sunday evenings. And I want to give them the title, Songs on the Road. So here is our first, Psalm 127 of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We're now we're going to sing it. So let's turn to number 127 in our praise book. You always get a slightly different view of something when you sing it, having heard it read. So I hope this will help us to think about it more. Number 127, unless the Lord constructs the house, the builders work in vain. The Lord alone designs and builds foundations that remain. Number 127.
now our offering will be taken up as the musicians play for us. And you might like to look over those words of Psalm 127 again. Let us pray again together. And let us approach with confidence the throne of grace and our great God who sits upon it and who has the affairs of heaven and earth in his hands and his control. And before we pray, I'll read a few verses from one of the Psalms which speak of the education of our children, the next generation, in the ways and the truth of the Lord. Give ear, writes the psalmist, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much for the household of faith to which we who call upon your name through our Lord Jesus belong. And we thank you for the way that you have been building that great household of faith for so many centuries. We think of the way that you called Abraham, the father of the Israeli nation, to follow you, to leave his country and his home, and to set out to a place that you would show him and to a land that you promised to give to him and his descendants. And we thank you for the way in which the God-given record of the history of Israel has been passed on to us. The history of Israel culminating in the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true Savior, the ultimate one whom you have given to us that we should follow him and be rescued by him. And we thank you too, dear Father, for the way in which in your Bible you command us and encourage us to teach the truth of the Scriptures, the truth of the Gospel, to our children, to the rising generation. And we pray that you will help us to be faithful in that work, in this church and in many churches where the young people are looked after, cared for, and taught. We thank you, therefore, dear Father, for the work of teaching of our young people that goes on here in Scotland. We thank you this evening especially for the work of the UCCF 
the universities and uh, colleges Christian Fellowship and pray that you will continue to bless their work through their many leaders and uh, junior helpers, relay workers and staff members and the many young men and women who take a lead in the, the university Christian unions. We ask that you will give them strength and joy and courage in their work. We pray this evening particularly for Peter Dixon, who is now uh, the leader of the UCCF team in Scotland, having been in that position for two or three months. And we pray that you will continue to encourage him in his work and to give him joy and clear thinking and vision for everything that he has to do. We thank you too, dear Father, for the work of Scripture Union, which deals with so many young people in different circumstances, both at schools and with uh, summer camps and weekends, seeking again to teach the young people of our churches the truth about the Bible and to give them strength to stand. We pray for your servants who work on the staff of Scripture Union and ask you to give them many encouragements and strength when they face difficulties. And we pray for our young people, both in this church and in other churches, and ask that you will enable them to be equipped and ready as the years go on, as they grow uh, physically and mentally into maturity. And we pray that there will be many in our churches who in years to come will be unashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified, who will be willing to share that faith will be willing to stand by the teaching of the Bible, willing to be soldiers, soldiers of the cross, soldiers for the Lord Jesus. We pray too, dear Father, that you will help them to love you and to love the Lord Jesus, not only to serve, but to love and delight in the one they serve. We pray that you'll give them grace and open eyes to seek out the lost. And we pray that you will be preparing many of these uh, young people perhaps some who are children now, to be responsible leaders in our churches for the future. Dear God, our Father, thank you that you are watching over your work. And we pray that you will help us to play our part in its development. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's turn now in our hymn book to number 548, number 548, how sure the scriptures are, God's vital urgent word, as true as steel and far more sharp than any sword, number 548.
Well, do let me ask you to turn up Psalm 127 again, please. And then let us bow our heads for another moment of prayer. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Thank you, dear Father, that you have spoken to us in the Bible and that you speak to us today in the same scriptures. And we pray that you will help us to love you, to know you better, and to serve you more wholeheartedly. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So Psalm 127, and my title this evening is A Household More Enduring Than Solomon's. Now, we'll get to the psalm in a moment, but I just want to, do, to say one or two other things first before we get into the text. I want to say something about our current situation here in our church, because I do think that this Psalm 127 will help us in our present position. On our church's in tray, there is a challenge, a challenge to build and to grow and to spread. In fact, a challenge to plant the gospel in two new locations in Kelvin Grove, which is that away, and in Queen's Park, which is that away. Now, it's a big challenge to organize and nurture a church in just one location, as we know. But the prospect of taking on two new centers of operation next year is really very stretching. Uh, many of you were at that Wednesday evening meeting, not last week, but the week before, and I thought it was a most encouraging meeting, but I think at the same time that all of us gulped at the prospect of the implications of what we were taking on. We've been asking ourselves the question, who will do all the work required? Where shall we find the personnel to provide music, to do administrative tasks and backup, teaching, preaching, catering, leadership of small groups and children's work and youth work, etc., etc. So the task in front of us is a task of building, building the Lord's work, building up and extending the household of the Lord's people. And this metaphor of building is one of the metaphors taught by the Apostle Paul. For example, he writes this to the Ephesian Christians, Ephesians chapter 2. You are members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul pictures the church there as a building which is being built up by God himself, a building fit for God to dwell in, and its members are God's household. Similarly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. So if we think of our task in the years ahead as a task of developing the building and strengthening the household of God, we're thinking in the right way, because we're allowing Paul's teaching to mold the way that we look at the work of evangelism and pastoral care. But... What sort of a building will we build? Will it be an enduring building, a strong building that can withstand the shocks of wind and weather? Paul says to the Corinthians, let each one take care how he builds on the foundation. And he goes on rather ominously to say that we can either build with durable materials, gold or silver or precious stones, or, perish the thought, with wood, hay or straw perishable materials which will not endure the searching test of fire. So as the Tron Church sets out on its new adventures, we must resist any temptation to be jerry builders. The job needs to be done well, and there's the challenge for us. So let's turn now to this psalm, because I trust it will help us. Verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. 
Now, it's a great help to us to know that Solomon wrote this psalm. In fact, knowing that this was written by the king of Israel, who was also the son of David, helps us to understand what Solomon is talking about here. These verses are not written by some small private individual like you or me. If it was the work of a small farmer or a village shopkeeper, it would have a much narrower focus and application. We might think that it was just about a private individual building his own three-bedroom house and raising his own little family of children. But this is written by the king of Israel, in fact, one of the great kings of Israel, who took his responsibilities so seriously that when he was very newly crowned king, he asked the Lord to give him not riches or fame or long life, but wisdom so that he could govern his people justly and ably. And God did indeed give him wisdom. And the crowning achievement of Solomon's reign was that he built a house, not a three-bedroom semi-detached, but the most important house in the world, the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. It was the thing that he was specifically commissioned to do. And the Old Testament history books, the books of Kings and Chronicles, regard the temple as being so important that the account of building it and launching it is given four long chapters in the first book of Kings and seven chapters in the second book of Chronicles. Now, Psalm 127 reads almost as if Solomon is writing it to himself as a kind of memo to self to keep his thinking on the right lines as he oversees this great task of building the Lord's temple in Jerusalem. As though he's saying to himself, Solomon, remember, unless the Lord oversees and sustains the work of building this temple, all your stone cutters and joiners and metal workers are laboring in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city of Jerusalem while the temple is being built, all your teams of night watchmen are superfluous. And look at verse 2 as a memo to self. Solomon, get your lights out by 10.30 and do not get up until 7 in the morning. Don't wear yourself out by poring over the architect's plans until midnight and then getting up at 6 in the morning to go jogging. That is not the way to carry on. In fact, there's a very interesting and touching detail in verse 2 which strongly authenticates this psalm as being the work of Solomon. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 12, no need to turn it up, but back in 2 Samuel 12, we have the account of Solomon's birth. I'll read it. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. Now she needed comfort because her first baby had had died as part of God's judgment. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son. And David called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now, do you see what's going on there? This baby is born and David the father calls him Solomon. That's what fathers did. They would call their son whatever they wanted to. But David's friend, the prophet Nathan, comes to David, I guess within a day or two of the birth, And he says to him, your majesty, I've had a word from the Lord about this boy. You are to give him another name, a second name, Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. Isn't that delightful? For some reason, the Lord had a particular love for Solomon, and he gave him this second name, my beloved Jedidiah. Now look at verse 2 in our psalm. All this late to bed, early to rise stuff is useless, for the Lord gives sleep to his beloved. It's a kind of cryptic remark. And the Hebrew word used there comes from the same root as Jedidiah. Isn't this Solomon's memo to himself? In the midst of this great building project, a project which took several years to complete, up the stairs and into your bed, Jedidiah, sleep is the Lord's gift to the one that he loves. Solomon, of course, went through his whole life knowing that his second name was Jedidiah, and that knowledge of his name peeps out in this last line of verse 2. And then why should Solomon have added the three final verses about children? 
because producing a family was all part of his responsibility as the king of Israel. These verses, like the first two, need to be read in the context of Solomon's own life. The children of the king of Israel, look at verse 4, are to be weapons in the king's armory, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, is the way verse 4 puts it. Now, you and I, if we have children, don't think of them as weapons, do we? They might be a handful at times, but they're not a quiverful. They're not arrows to be shot at our enemies. But they were for Solomon. Look at verse 5. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So when enemies come, when some pagan king backed by a strong army, comes and threatens the gates of Jerusalem, Solomon can come to the gate and speak to him. And if King Solomon is backed by his own muscular sons, armed with spear and sword, the enemy king will realize that he might just have bitten off more than he can chew. If the rising generation is strong, Solomon is not going to be put to shame in some hostile altercation at the gates of Jerusalem. In fact, the idea of the dynasty, the ongoing generations of the kings of Israel, is written into the very fabric of the Old Testament, and Solomon would have known this very well. As you know, the first king of Israel was Saul. Saul reigned for many years, but he died in disgrace because he had turned away from the Lord. He would proved to be fundamentally disobedient to God. And so the Lord raised up David to replace him. David loved the Lord, and he served the Lord, unlike Saul. Now, it is, true that, it is true that David had a serious episode of sin and disobedience when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered Bathsheba's husband. But unlike Saul, as soon as David was confronted with his sin by Nathan the prophet, remember that great incident, you are the man, as soon as that happens, he repented and he was forgiven. David was the king of God's choice, and when he was established as king in Jerusalem after Saul's death, the prophet Nathan came to him and gave him the Lord's message. Now, I'll read out a part of this. This is the Lord speaking, most of it in the first person singular to David through the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So here's Nathan speaking to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Second Samuel chapter 7. That is a very important prophecy in the unfolding story of the kingdom of Israel. And did you notice what the Lord promises to David there? First of all, a son, and that son, of course, is, is Solomon Jedidiah, who will build a house for the name of the Lord, and that is the temple. But the Lord is also promising David a house in a slightly different sense, in the sense of an ongoing family line. And we sometimes speak of the house of Stuart or the house of Windsor when we're talking of the monarchs of Britain, and we use house in the sense of an enduring royal family. And that's what the prophet Nathan has in mind as he speaks to David. And our Psalm 127, although it's only a little psalm, only five verses long, it speaks of both of those houses. The house of verse 1 is first and foremost the temple in Jerusalem. But the children in verses 3 to 5 are the succeeding generations of Solomon's family who will not in the end be cowed by their enemies. The kingly line of Israel will, in the end, in its ultimate king, the Lord Jesus, put all its enemies under its feet. Now, I think all of that is necessary historical background. 
to our understanding of the psalm. We'll understand this psalm much better if we can see what Solomon was thinking about and what he was coping with when he wrote it. Well, let me pause just for a moment to fire a gentle broadside. If you pick up a Bible passage of this kind and then ask, what does this passage mean to me? You'll be asking the wrong question. The question to ask is not, what does this passage mean to me? But, what did Solomon mean by it? The meaning of a Bible passage is determined by the writer's intention, not by the reader's response. John Stott, who died a few years ago, was a very fine Bible teacher. And I once heard him say this, and I shall never forget it. A Bible passage means what its original author meant. So if you or I pick up this psalm and ask, what does this mean to me? We'll come up with all sorts of nonsense. Nonsense based on our, on our own narrow experiences of life and our personal eccentricities. But when we ask, what did the author mean by these words? A much wider and richer world is opened up to us. And as we discover what the human author meant, we shall also be discovering what the divine author meant and means by it. So to ask what does it mean to me is to gag the voice of God in favor of our own voice. But when we ask what did Solomon mean by these words, we begin to open our ears to the voice of the Lord. Well, let's look a bit more closely now at the psalm and we'll ask ourselves what Solomon meant and what the Lord means uh, to teach through it. And we'll look at this under two headings. First, there are two ways to build. Verse 1, just verse 1, gives us a picture of a right way to build and a wrong way to build. In both of these ways, there are plenty of people being active. The joiners and the plasterers and the stonemasons are working with their sleeves rolled up. They're busy. There's plenty of activity going on. But in one method, the hand of the great unseen builder, the Lord himself, is also at work. And in the other method, it's not at work, the hand of the Lord. If the Lord is building the house, says Solomon, the work of the human builders will be fruitful and lasting. But if the Lord is not building the house, the work of the human builders is in vain. Do you see how that bleak little phrase, in vain, comes twice in verse 1 and once in verse 2? There can be a great deal of human activity, but it can all be useless. A good uh, Bible example of the wrong kind of building is the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. You remember the story how people got together and they produced a great deal of human activity. You can hear just how busy they were and how committed they were in the words they say to each other. Come, they say, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. So they founded the Busy Bee Brick Factory and they produced enormous quantities of bricks. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Now that dream of building the tallest building on earth has been around for a very long time, hasn't it? I think the tallest building at the moment is in Dubai, isn't it? I guess in a few years' time it'll be somewhere else. That dream lives on. But the problem with the Tower of Babel was that the Lord had no part in it. In fact, the people who built the tower explicitly excluded him from their plans. Let us make a name for ourselves, they said. They had no wish to honor the name of the Lord. They were out for their own glory and their own reputation. But their building proved to be in vain because the Lord came to inspect it. And he was not pleased with this self-motivated, self-honoring project. The people said, let us make a name for ourselves. But God said, let us confuse their language so that they can no longer understand each other's words. And the Lord scattered them and dispersed them. And the great building project was abandoned and came to nothing. The people were very active, but the Lord was not building with them. And the ruin of the Tower of Babel is a perpetual monument to the folly of trying to build without seeking to honor the Lord. Well, this is going to make us ask, what does a project, I'm thinking of our sort of work today, what does a project look like when the Lord and the people are working together and building together. 
What does it mean for the Lord and his people to be co-builders and co-workers? The key question to ask must be, is the project in line with the Bible's teaching? If it's in line with the Bible's teaching, it's in line with the will of God. So what are the core features of gospel work as the Bible teaches it? I'll just mention six very briefly. First, the work seeks to honor God the Father and to honor the Lord Jesus. Hallowed be thy name is a core ingredient of Christian prayer. Second, the work seeks to honor the message of the Bible. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, pray for us that the word of the Lord, the message of the Lord, may speed ahead and be honored. Third, the work seeks to save the lost. Jesus said about his own ministry, his own role, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Fourth, the work is marked by prayer and the ministry of the word. Those were the two things identified by the apostles as fundamental to their their ministry. Fifth, the work seeks to promote godly living in the church. Paul writes to Titus of the knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. And sixth, the work seeks to harness the energy of every Christian in the fellowship. Paul writes to the Romans, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. That's what this form is all about, isn't it? Harnessing the energy of all of us. Now, you could develop that list a lot further. I've just picked out half a dozen features of what the Bible teaches about gospel work, just as examples, to make the point that if we do our work and develop our work along Bible-taught lines, we know we're following the Lord's will for us, and we can have confidence that he's with us as our co-builder and co-worker. But if our aim were to to be to advance and honor our own name— or perhaps to rewrite the gospel, taking bits of it out and putting new bits in, or to redefine ethical behavior and to throw off the ethics of the Bible, we could have no confidence that the Lord was building our project with us. So let's stick to the kind of gospel work taught in the Bible as we take on the Kelvin Grove and Queen's Park projects, and we can be assured that we're not building without the arm of the Lord sustaining us and giving us energy. But let's notice from verse 1 that there is no suggestion that the Lord's work can go forward without the active involvement and work of the human builders. It's the Lord and the people working together which builds the household or the house. Real gospel work is always simultaneously his work and our work. It's he who supplies us with mental and physical energy for the work. This is something that the Apostle Paul teaches us in Colossians chapter 1, where he's writing to the Colossians about his great aim, and that is to present every Christian mature in Christ. (coughs) And about that aim, he says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Doesn't that put it well? I toil, says Paul, and he supplies me with the energy. Now, this means that as the Lord gets to work, we get to work as well. But what the Bible never allows for us is to head for the armchair or the feather bed and then to do nothing while the Lord works without us. No, it's not like that. The Lord works through his people and he fills them with the strength needed for the task. Would you really want to be a lazy bones Christian? Well, yes, you might say. Sometimes. Lovely idea. Well, we all have idle slob written somewhere into our DNA. I certainly speak for myself. But the Lord, in his kindness, has the habit of turning the sluggard through 180 degrees. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. But when the Lord is building the house, the work of the human co-workers proves very fruitful. So two ways to build. Now, second, let's notice from the rest of the psalm, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, let's notice three aspects of fruitful labor. The first is that the Lord's workers are guardians of the work. 
Still in verse 1, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So the Lord's workers are watchmen as well as builders. Now in Solomon's day, there would have been hundreds of sentries posted on the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And their task was to watch out for the attack of any enemy. They were guardians and protectors. And if any threat appeared on the horizon, they were to shout out, enemy in sight, prepare to defend the Lord's city. So the Lord's work of building the household of God needs to be protected by watchful guardians. And I guess in the average Christian congregation, it's likely to be the more senior people who are better equipped to be on the watch because they're the ones who know their Bibles better, at least they ought to be. When you're a very young Christian, you're comparatively clueless about the dangers that can threaten the church. But the Bible soon teaches you that there are many dangers, false teaching which always leads to false living. The New Testament letters are constantly warning the congregations against false teaching and false living. So we need to develop a nose that can scent false teaching and pick up the bad smell of false living. And when we scent it, we must sound the alarm. The Lord gives us all a share in the responsibility of protecting the family from danger. Then secondly... From verse 2, fruitful labor includes refreshing rest. I know I said something a bit snooty a moment ago about the feather bed and the armchair. But in verse 2, Solomon makes the point that a combination of overwork and anxiety is a very bad thing. It is in vain, he says, that you rise up so early and go so late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. He puts it so powerfully. Think of him. There he is, the young king of Israel, feeling the weight of the world upon his shoulders with this great project, burning the midnight oil, taking his first slug of coffee at 5.30 in the morning. Don't be like that, he's saying to himself and to us, for the Lord gives his Jedidiah sleep. When I get home later this evening, I shall have a brief skirmish in the kitchen with some cheese and biscuits. And then I shall be upstairs to bed, and I shall know nothing until the cocks start to crow. Now, a little bit more seriously. Verse 2 does contain an important message for us. Sleep is a gift from the Lord God. He gives his beloved sleep. And it's not a gift to be despised or refused. Think of Jesus in the boat on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples when the storm suddenly blew up. They were terrified. But when they went to look for Jesus, he was at the back of the boat, fast asleep with his head on the cushion. I think he had understood the second verse of Psalm 127. Students, are there students in the congregation? Don't be up till one in the morning playing computer games. You will get exhausted. Older people, that's people of 24 and older, (laughs) draw a line under the day's work, when the time comes. Switch off that screen. Give yourselves 10 hours break. I was going to say 12. At least 10 hours break from emails. You need to, otherwise you'll get hollowed out. Sleep is a gift of God to his beloved, to those he loves. So fruitful labor involves guarding the work, being watchman, resting from the work, and finally, raising the next generation. This is what the last three verses are all about. Now, I know that we can look at these verses and read them in a personal way. And there is a personal application of them to married couples who are given children. Children are a blessing to their parents. But Solomon's big concern in this psalm is with the building of the Lord's house and the Lord's household. In any Christian congregation, not everybody marries and not every married couple is given children but we can all be concerned with the raising of the next generation of the Lord's family. Because as they are trained in the Lord's warfare, they do become like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Think of it, who is going to be battling for the gospel in 30 years' time? Not going to be me. I shall be subterranean, or at least in Zimmerland. But our children and our young people Those who are growing up now in the nurture of the Bible today, they are the Lord's arrows and warriors for the future, 
Let's nurture them, therefore. They're the most precious resource. As verse 3 puts it, they are a heritage from the Lord. And a heritage is something to be cherished and looked after very carefully. Well, friends, we're almost there. We're coming into land. The building of the Lord's house and household is Solomon's concern and God's concern. And that's why it's our concern as well. It is a great privilege to be involved in this work. It is a great joy. It's demanding. But when the Lord builds with his co-builders, when the Lord watches over the city with his fellow watchers, when the Lord gives sleep to his weary beloved, and when the Lord gives and raises the next generation of his fellow workers, then the Lord's people can embrace new challenges with confidence. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. But when the Lord builds with the builders, the household is blessed and the building will endure. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much again for the wisdom given to Solomon and for the way in which this psalm speaks of the ongoing growth of the work of building the house and the household. Give us grace, uh, dear Father, to serve you with all our hearts, we pray, and teach us how to do it. Be with us and give us strength to our arms and our, our minds as well to think about things and to apply ourselves to this joyous work of building your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's turn now to our final hymn, which is number 567. 567. Christ is made the sure foundation, Christ the head and cornerstone, <clears throat> chosen of the Lord and precious, binding all the church in one. 567.
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.